Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 35. The Bible says, Jesus told them, he's talking to his disciples, he's at the Last Supper. Jesus told them, tonight all of you will desert me. You're all going to ditch me, you're all going to bail, you're going to leave me, you're all going to abandon me, you're going to betray me. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. Not only are you going to desert me, you're going to deny that you even know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never, I will never. Have you ever said I will never? Yeah. <laughs> me and Peter, see, me and Peter are very alike. And, and I guess that you're pretty alike to Peter and you're pretty alike to me too. Here's the, here's the truth. We're, we're all alike to each other. You want to know why? Because we're all human. Yeah. We're working. Perfect. Nobody is. Perfect. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So then Jesus gets put on trial. Jesus gets taken up. Jesus is in the face of the two biggest powers of the time, which was the Roman Empire and religious teachers and religious teachers of law. These were the two greatest powers of that time. That's like mom and dad at home. They were the authorities that pretty much can execute, pretty much can tell someone that they can keep living another 25 years. They had that type of authority. So now Jesus is in front of these people and they're about to arrest him so that he can get crucified. And then the Bible says, meanwhile, all this is happening, Jesus is at the front. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard where Jesus was getting tried. And then a servant girl, can you say a servant girl? Servant. Can you say a little girl? A little girl. a little girl tripped him up. And the servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean, but Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. First time he denied, okay? Later on, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said, to those standing around. This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some, other, some, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent, by the way that you talk. Hey, man, you can't deny it. We can tell. We can tell. You, can, we, you, you can't deny it. Even if you do deny it, we can tell. Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. My goodness. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Wow. Peter was on trial. God put Peter on trial. And God will put you and I on trial. Can you say, I'm on trial? I'm on trial. And this is very important to our process of healing. Because sometimes we don't understand why we go through certain things. We're trying to get close to God, and then all of a sudden, everything starts falling apart. We're trying to get close to Jesus. We're trying to come to church a little bit more often, and then everything starts getting worse. And it's important for us to understand why things get worse. And sometimes it's because the enemy is pulling you away from God, the enemy of your soul, which is called Satan, Lucifer, the devil, the slanderer, evil. He wants to pull you away because he hates you, because you were created in God's image, and you bear God's image, and he hates God. So he wants to destroy your life and he will use your iniquities as leverage to destroy you because he knows you're bent. He knows what catches you. If money is not your thing and it's guys, he's going to use guys. If girls is not your thing and money is your thing, he's going to use money. If, 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 if rejection is your thing, he's not going to use money and he's not going to use guys and he's not going to use girls. He's going to use rejection to keep you imprisoned, to keep you in a place of bondage. And that's why I like this song, I'm No Longer. A slave. Uh, 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 uh. I am no longer no slave. I declare myself delivered by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Because only the blood has the power to cleanse my life. So being put on trial is necessary. And you have to have the correct perspective. Because sometimes we need to know what's inside of us. And being on trial is what allows us to know what's inside of us. God will put you on trial. Before God puts you in your purpose... He will put you on trial. But the thing is that when you're put on trial by God, it feels like everything gets worse. Trials are the tough, tough moments that make our willpower and our good intentions bend. 
Trials is what makes our good will. Trials are those tough, tough moments that make our good intentions, our good will bend and forsake what we really, really want to do. Trials test us, and the point of a test is to show us results. Can we all agree and say amen? Amen. The point of a test is to show us results, and the purpose of results is to show us where we're truly standing in comparison to where we think we're standing. Some of you go, I'm a really good driver. Nah, yeah, nah. <laughs> Some of you think, I'm a really great friend. Let's ask for feedback. Hold up, hold up. Let's ask for feedback. Let's see if you're really there in the tough times. Some of you think that you're a great singer. <laughs> Have you heard Christine Kane? She's a preacher says, instead of shout to the Lord, we're all going to cry to the Lord. (laughs) And so sometimes we think that we are something that we're really, really not. And tests allow us to see results to show us where we're truly standing and not where we think we are standing. Peter thought that he stood with Jesus. And that's what he genuinely thought. And Peter genuinely felt that he would never betray Jesus. Peter genuinely meant it. No, I'm going to go with you till death. And he genuinely thought and believed that he stood with Jesus. But God had to put Peter on trial so that what was within him could come out. So that what was within him, so that what was inside of him could come out. Sometimes we need to go through a trial so that God could show us what's really inside of our hearts. And without the trial, we won't really know what's inside of our hearts. So in other words, God had to test Peter, not for God's sake, but for Peter's own sake. So that Peter could know what he truly was. It wasn't for, if it wasn't for the trial, Peter would have never known that he actually carried betrayal. Some of us think we're loyal people, yeah? Some of us think that we're extremely obedient, yeah? Some of us go, and I would never, never do something like that. Well, just wait a minute, let's see if God puts you on trial. If it wasn't for the trial, Peter would have never known that he carried betrayal in him. He legit never thought that he would betray Jesus. He said, I'm with you till I die. But it wasn't until he was placed on trial. Can you say on trial? trial. That the betrayal that he carried inside came out. Some of us think we're more spiritual than what we are. Some of us think that we're more faithful than what we are. And some of us think that we are stronger than what we are. And some of us think that we are purer than what we are. And this is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, if you think... If you think, can you say, if you think, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. We're not as strong as we think sometimes. We're not as powerful as we think sometimes. We're not as integrous as we think we are. We are not as holy as we think we are. We're not as righteous as we think we are. We're not as beautiful as we think we are in the inside, of course. (laughs) And the problem with thinking that we're stronger than what we really are is that we may be deceived And when we're deceived thinking that we're stronger, we may be standing in pride before God's eyes. That's why when teenagers tell me and they go, but I love her. I will always be with her and I will commit to her. You're 14. You barely, you have peach fuzz. You barely grow a beard. And some guys grow beards and they're committed and they think they are until they're placed on trial. Until they're placed on. Until that girl that comes in that was the girl of his dreams. And then the one that said, you know, I thought I was the girl of your dreams. He's like, oh, I switched. Why? Because there's something inside that he has no clue about that he has a bent towards. Vice versa with girls. Vice versa with everything. That sometimes we don't know what we really are. And so if you think that you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. And God... If God, if God sees that you think that you are stronger, and if, and, and if God sees that there's pride in your heart because you think that you're better, God can't heal you because God can't heal the proud because God resists the proud. He won't heal someone who doesn't see their soul sickness. God can't heal someone 
that doesn't recognize and acknowledge that they have iniquities, a soul sickness. As I was in my retreat, I was looking at the roof, the ceiling, and I was going, God, man. And I was just reflecting on my own personal life. And I'm like, man, I'm sick. My soul is sick. I need, I need your deliverance. I need your deliverance. I need you to heal me because I can't get rid of some of the things that are in me. That no matter, I mean, we read Romans chapter 7, right? Read that at home. Message version is powerful. It's like you wrote your own journal. Paul just described your every inch when it comes to this. I was telling God, I, I can't control myself. I can't help myself. I can't stop myself. I can't heal myself. I can't transform myself. I'm sick in the soul. And some of us are sick in the soul, but God can't heal you. God will not heal you. He can't heal you if you think that you're healthy. If we don't get healed, and this is the problem, that if we don't get healed, then we can't live the life God intends for us. Now, that sentence, is sound, it sounds just so cliche. We can't live the life that God intends for us. Oh, no. Boo-hoo, right? Think. Think. Think of what it feels like to bathe in the tub of unsatisfaction. If you didn't really understand what I just meant with my analogy or my metaphoric way of speech, think about what it feels like when you're just laying in bed and you're unsatisfied with your life. Think about that. Think about that. God didn't intend for you to live an unsatisfied life. God didn't intend for you to live a mediocre life either. God didn't intend for you to live a good life either. He intended for you to live a blessed life. Prospered in joy, prospered in peace, prospered in confidence, prospered in wisdom, prospered in understanding, prospered in your family, prospered in your career, prospered with your friendships, prospered with your mouth, prospered with the things that come out of your mouth. This is what God intends for you, for you to live enriched, for you to live fruitful, for you to live prosperous, for you to live bright, for you to live a life that actually brings forth channels of living water water that comes forth from inside out not an Instagram happy life if we don't get here we can't live the life God intends for us and we also can't fulfill the purpose God has for us cause catch this quote on the screen the weight of God's purpose can't be sustained without deliverance found in the process God's purpose is so big for your life. And you hear this a lot, but you got to hear it again. God didn't design you with no reason. God designed you for something specific. Not to do or have a good life. Because some of you are like, well, I'm going to build a career and get some money and da 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 And pay my bills and, you know, buy a house. And that's great. Buy a house. Buy some property. Get the car that you've always wanted. That's amazing. But God didn't design you for that. You don't know what he did. You don't know why he designed you, but he designed you with something powerful and purposeful that is not common. And when you step into what God has designed for your life, then you start living a fulfilled life, a blessed life. But that purpose that God designed you for has extreme weight. It's big because God thinks big. God plans big. God designs big. God's blueprint for your life is big. God's purpose for your life is huge. God's dream for you is big. And so that big dream, that big purpose, it can't be sustained until you're delivered through process. In order to get the purpose, you have to have deliverance. Because imagine someone in chains and shackles trying to carry something of value in their life. It's not the same as if they had freedom. It's not the same. So God wants to deliver you and he wants to heal you. So don't resent the trial. Don't resent the heat. Don't get frustrated with the process. Instead, watch this. Commit to the process, accept the heat, and embrace the trial. Embrace the trial. Embrace the trial. Turn to your neighbor. Be like, embrace the trial. Embrace it. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Don't just stare at me and say it. Turn to your neighbor and actually give him an instruction. Give her an instruction. Embrace the trial. 
Without the trials, the heat and the process, we can't inherit the promise. We need the trial. Look at me for a few seconds. We need the trials in our life. We need the process. We need the tough times. We need the hard moments. We need the heat to be turned up sometimes. Now, Peter denied Jesus at Jesus' lowest point. And that's a terrible thing to do to someone that you really love, right? Not being there for someone that you said that you loved. Denying someone that you said that you loved at their lowest, that's called betrayal. Can you say betrayal? Betrayal. And notice how Jesus is always the one that's getting hurt. But even though he's the one that's getting hurt by you, by me, he still remains faithful to you and to me. Because Jesus came, he came, he didn't want to come and punish Peter, and he doesn't want to come and punish you. Some of us live with a punishment mentality where when we slip up, we think that God is ready to punish us. And that's not true because Jesus already took the punishment for you, and he didn't just take it for you from yesterday backwards. He took it for you from your first day till your last day. And this is why Jesus said this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, Jesus Christ. So don't feel hopeless. Don't feel condemned or banished or useless as if God can't use your life or come near you because you're too dirty to touch. Do not feel like you're too dirty to be used by him or like it's too late for him to touch your life. Do not believe that you've messed up so much that you've lost all opportunity or like God is sick and tired of you or as if your sin is too much for God to handle. Do not think like that. You are not hopeless. You are not unusable. You have a savior who redeems, restores, and renews. You have a savior who redeems, restores, and renews. This is why Jesus, our redemption. You sound pretty good. He's your redeemer. Wow. But you, but, 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 but you will look at your life and when other people around you that know your life look at your life, we're all going like, but Why? Right? Because you keep tripping up, and then you get up, and then you keep tripping up again, and then you get up, and then you trip up again, and then you get up, and then you trip up again, and you get up, and then you trip up again, and you get up, and then you trip up again, you get up. If you count that those seven times, seven times a righteous fall, seven times God picks them up. Hallelujah. (laughs) Just because you've tripped doesn't mean that God has discarded you. Someone needs to take that into your heart. It doesn't mean that God is tired of you. It doesn't mean that God is disappointed in you or that he hates you. God doesn't hate you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to restore you. He wants to renew you. He wants to love you. He wants to grow you. He wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to free you. He wants to sing to you. He wants to hold you. He wants to hug you. He wants to caress you. He wants to restore your life to the purpose he has called you for. Don't think that God is tired. You can't tire God. He ain't no human man to love like human does. We get tired of one another. God doesn't though. God is stronger than us. God can love stronger than us. All you need to do is turn your heart to God and God will set you free. But before he sets you free, he needs to show you what you don't know about your self say it with me I don't know me I don't know me me. and that's the truth you think you do that's when people go like you don't know me don't say anything child of God (laughs) you don't even know yourself you don't know my story yeah I, I understand I probably don't know your story you got it right but you and some of you in this room you need to stop using your past and your story as a green card to stay the same. Yes, it happened. But now it's time for us to receive healing. Or you're gonna stay there and that's not a good place because God didn't call you to stay there. God wants to restore you, he wants to redeem you and he wants to renew you. To give you new strength, to give you new perspective, different understanding, a new way of life, not a good life, a blessed life. Not the best life, the blessed life. That's what God wants to do. Peter had no clue 
that he had betrayal in him. And if God would have given him his destiny before he put him on trial, he would have destroyed it all. Jesus is this crazy, famous celebrity that keeps telling everybody in the city and everybody in the nation, you're going to put me to death. I'm going to die for three days. And I'm going to resurrect. And all his disciples, including Peter, they're like, yeah, that's right. Oh. And, 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 and they were just so, and then, and then, and then, because Jesus told them, I have a kingdom that I'm going to establish. But they had no clue that the kingdom that God was going to establish was an eternal kingdom in our hearts. It wasn't an earthly one. So when Judas, can you say Judas? Judas. That traitor, right? When Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Peter's like, we got two swords, Lord. And he took his swords out because Peter thought that God, that Jesus was going to defend the kingdom that he had been speaking about. But Jesus had to go on trial. Jesus had to go on trial in order for the fruitfulness of what we are harvesting today could happen 2,000 years later. And so now all the disciples are like, oh, shoot, our leader's dead. The move is done because the one leading the movement is buried in the ground. And Peter remembered a promise. Peter, P -P -Peter, Peter received a promise from Jesus, and Jesus was like, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. You're going to be that guy. You're going to be that leader. When I raise from the dead, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm like back to life, I'm going to build my church on you. You're going to be the main man. So Peter received the promise. Now, if God would have given Peter that promise before he was placed on trial. Can you imagine what would have happened? Everything would have been destroyed. He would have destroyed it all because persecution at a higher level was coming in the near future that Peter had no clue about. And if he would have denied Jesus in the promise, in the future, at the top of his purpose, the stakes would have been higher. Yeah, that's true. But look at Peter's transformation. When he was confronted with the same issue, association with Jesus. Look at the transformation in comparison to before the trial and after the trial. Before the trial, a little girl made him shake. After the trial, he's being faced with this superpower, the religious law teachers that could put him to death. Look at the difference of what being put on trial can do in your life. Acts chapter five, the religious leader said, we gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. Instead, you filled all of Jerusalem with your teaching about him. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God. God. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a little girl's threat in regards to my association with Jesus made me shake. But now I'm going to make the threats of these officials of the law shake because I was put on trial. I withstood the process. I got my deliverance. And now I stand free. Now I stand free. Now I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am. I am a child of God. Oh, the power of actually sticking through your trial. It can save your life. Your husband's life. I don't have one. He's coming. Your wife's life. Your kid's life. Save a whole generation's life. Who is connected to your yes? You got to think about that. Because I know your wife or your husband is, for sure. And if you're planning to have kids, they will be too. But outside from that, and here's the problem, that some of you are, God is putting you in trial and you keep running away from God. 
This is why you're the same. Same mood. <laughs> how you doing? Could be better. Next day, how you doing? Could be better. How you doing? Things are getting worse. <laughs> Do you know why we're sometimes like that? It's because we never allow God the opportunity to keep us in the process. And when God puts you on trial, the transformation is incredible. What you beat today, listen, your trial, your trial, your trial, your trial is your preparation. Stop running away from your preparation. Before the process, a little girl would make Peter shake. After God put Peter on trial, he made the threats of law officials shake. God had to put him on trial first in order to allow the ugly that was inside of him, which is betrayal, to come out instead of having the ugly come out in the future. Your trial, your trial, your trial, your trial today, 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 your trial today is your preparation to slay your giants tomorrow. You run away, you run away from your child today, your giants will kill you tomorrow. You all have giants to face. You all have giants to face. We all have giants to face. I have giants to face. And I know that if I don't beat now, if I don't stick to my trial now, if I don't stick in the process now, then I know what's ahead. Then I know what's ahead. God will put you on trial. Can I say on trial? In order for you to have a clue about the ugly that you had no clue about. God will put you on trial so that you can have a clue. So that you can have a clue about the ugly that you had no clue about. Because some of you don't have a clue about the ugly that you have. And so God has to show you. Kind of like when we squeeze a toothpaste tube. What's in comes out. God, the trial squeezes what's inside of you out. And some of you don't know what you are carrying in the inside until God puts you on trial. Listen to me. Some of you don't even know that you carry adultery inside. That one day you'll cheat. Not because you are a bad person, but because that's the inclination of your iniquity. Sexual morality. Some of you have the inclination, the iniquity of abandoning. You're not going to be there for your kids probably. Because that's an iniquity, that's a bent. Some of you have this inclination that you're not satisfied with one person, so you move on to the next person, you move on to the next person, and then you go on to another relationship, and then you and that's an iniquity that you carry that Jesus needs to heal you from. Yeah, Some of you have an attention deficit that you will do whatever it takes to receive attention. Some of you see the opposite sex like trophies. If I don't get him, mm, I need to get him. <laughs> oh, I see that. God will put you on trial in order for you to have a clue about the ugly that you don't have a clue about. When God puts you on trial, it's not a sign that you're discarded or hopeless. It's actually a sign that God is going to heal you and deliver you so that you can go to your next level. Being put on trial is a good sign. God is prepping you. So, what should you know when you're put on trial? Here are four things that you need to do, need to know. Number one, the trial lets you see the ugly, which we've established quite well. Let me go a little bit deeper. We start doing things we had no clue that we would do. We start acting up in ways where we go, what the heck is wrong with me? Man, I thought I was stronger than this. Yeah, no. God put you on trial. God put you on trial. He's testing you so that the test can bring results. And results are not for God's sake. The results are for your sake. Aren't you glad that the bus driver that drove you to church today passed his test? Aren't you glad that all the other drivers that you drive with kind of passed their test? (laughs) God has to put you in trial because he has to get off. He has to get us off our high horse to let us know that we aren't, we aren't as strong as we thought we are. You're going to start seeing how sinful you really are. You're going to start seeing how dark you really think. You're going to start seeing how sick your soul really is. Jesus said, the healthy do not need a doctor. It's the sick that need the doctor. We need Jesus Christ. We need Jesus Christ. We need Jesus Christ. 
Meaning that we're sick in the soul. And when you don't see how sick you are, you can't see your need for Jesus either. Jesus said this. Jesus told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. Too many people think they're good. Oh, I'm a good person. I don't need to be at church. Oh, hell yeah, you do. Oh, hell yes, you do. You need church more than you need food in your refrigerator right now. Well, I need God, and it's my thing with me and God alone, and I can have church by my own and pray to God. I pray to God. I listen to sermons. I'm reading Christian books. Uh-uh, that, that's not the pattern God left us in the book of Acts. That's, that's not it. Don't, don't, even, don't, 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 don't even try pulling that card off. You need a body. Because if your whole identity was your toenail, what the heck can you do in life? That's just one body part, correct? What are you going to do as a toenail, right? Bloop, 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 walk around. No, you need to be connected to a foot. And the foot needs to be connected to an ankle. And that ankle needs to be connected to a calf. And that calf needs to get connected to what? What is this called? A quad? And then the quad to the glute. And then I have none to God. I have mercy. The glute to the back. And then the back to the arms. The arms to the neck. And the neck to the head. Heck, good hair too. We need each other. Stop trying to think that you can do it on your own because you'll never do it on your own. And if you need to, listen, if you think that you need to do it on your own, God will not spare your career to teach you that. God will not spare your finances to teach you that lesson. If God did not spare his only son, what makes you think he's going to spare your career, your reputation, your image, or your finances. He disciplines those he loves. So if it means that he has to take that away from you in order for you to get the lesson, he will do it. Because he loves. This is number two. Don't get frustrated when you see the ugly. Stand in God's grace and realize that most of these ugly issues are iniquities in the heart that only God can heal us from. Now catch this, this is very important. This of course doesn't mean that you start indulging in your sin all under the name of, I'm on trial, God is just trying to show me how ugly I really am. Because sometimes we'll be like, hey man, I'm on trial, so I'm going to go and indulge and ride this wave. Don't ride that wave. That, that's not what God is calling you to do. That's not what God is allowing his process to do. Instead, if you're on trial, the posture of our heart will be, dang, I guess I messed up. Dang. I guess I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Dang, I guess I'm not what I thought I was. Dang. I guess I'm not who I thought I was. I need help. This anger. I need help. This greed. I need help. This depression, I need help. This fear, I need help. This eating disorder, I need help. These suicidal thoughts, I need help. This past of sexual abuse, I need help. This confusion, this anxiety problem, I need help. This rejection issue, I need help. This lust problem, I need help. The trial takes us to a place where we see the ugly, not so that we get frustrated, but instead for us to have a posture in our hearts where we realize how much we need God. So you should never go towards liberalism, which is, well, yeah, I'm on trial. Heck yeah. And you should never go to despair. I'm so stupid. I can't believe myself. This, again, not, not towards liberalism, nor towards despair, but instead, humility. Humility. Instead of humility. Because when God puts you on trial, the purpose is for us to see our condition and to see our need for him so that we can be positioned for healing and deliverance. So don't get frustrated. Number three, you will wrestle after you see the ugly. You're going to wrestle. 
God will give you your next steps on how to get rid of the ugly after the trial shows you you're ugly. There's this gap of time where we will wrestle with pulling through with this next step that God is setting before us or not. Don't delay. When God shows you you're ugly through the trial, God will also show you a next step. And here's the temptation to not take the next step. And the next step might be something difficult. But don't delay taking this step. This is the critical moment between choosing if we'll misuse God's grace to indulge in sin, which allows our iniquities to bring death, to grow, to be passed on, or if we use God's grace to receive deliverance from our iniquities. This is a crazy part of the process. When we're on trial, this is a crazy part of the process when we're on trial because you will wrestle with obeying God once you see you're ugly. And some of the stuff that you have in you that you have no clue you had in you is hard stuff to get rid of. It's hard stuff to get rid of. It's not easy to get rid of the ugly that is inside of us sometimes. But God allows us to know in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians that God won't give you something you can't handle. If you're going through it, you can handle it. Now, God won't tell you to get rid of it, and he will not tell you to transform yourself or to heal yourself. But he will tell you the steps you need to take in order for him to be the one who heals you. And this is where the period of wrestling begins. It's the in-between. And some of you are in the in-between. Should I take the step or not? If I take it, it's going to hurt me. Maybe. But it's going to hurt more if you don't. There's only one thing worse than not obeying God in this life. And that is wishing that you had obeyed God. Number four. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to tell you something. You're in a good place. Because God is willing to speak to you very clearly if he can see that your heart is in the right place. So if he's speaking to you right now about it, it's because your heart is in the right place. Even if your present life is not. That's hopeful. And he'll know whether or not your heart is in the right place. And if you're willing to do what he says to do, he'll know. So when he can see that you are willing and that inside your heart you're, you, you're willing to change and you're willing to take the step, he'll communicate to you. So all of you in this room, God is saying, I know that your heart is in the right place, even though your present life is not. I'm willing to communicate to you because I know that you are willing to change. So give God hope. Give God glory. I mean, he's giving you hope. That's good. Number four, here's what you need to know when you're in trial. Wanting to connect the dots keeps the ugly. Wanting to connect the dots actually keeps the ugly. Your freedom and deliverance, and this is my last thing that I'm saying tonight. Your freedom and deliverance will require a step of obedience that probably will not make sense to you. In other words, your miracle is literally one step of faith away. Can you say one step? step. Just one step away. It's something that won't make sense, and it's something that you probably find yourself asking, why that? Why is he asking me to do this? Why that thing? And you might want to connect the dots. Why this thing? How does this thing, that thing equal my healing? How does that thing, this thing equal my deliverance? And it's because God wants to get the glory. Say amen. God wants to get the glory for your miracles so that our rational minds won't pin the credit on something we can add up. But instead, it has to be something that won't make sense so that in our hearts, we know it was God alone who did it. If it makes sense, you might give credit for it to being rational. But if it's irrational, you have no choice but to give the credit and the glory to God. And your heart posture will be one of thankfulness. This might be something God has been speaking to you about for some time now. This step. This step might be something that you know you need to do because you've probably been feeling it for a while now. It keeps popping up. It keeps coming up. It keeps being mentioned. It keeps coming to you. The thoughts keep coming. It's a step that keeps happening inside your head, inside your heart. And this is God speaking to you, 
saying, this is the next step I want you to take. And if you take this next step, oh, I'll put everything in place. You do your part, which is the possible. I'll do my part, which is the impossible. And so you still may wrestle going, how does that equal my healing? And you can't seem to connect the dots, but you don't need to because all you need to do is trust. And once you do what he's calling you to, God will unlock the healing and deliverance and the miracles that you need right now. And see, if you're trying to connect, if you try to connect the dots in order to obey God so that you can receive your healing and your deliverance, all you're going to do is keep the ugly. Because without faith to obey God, God can't remove. You're ugly. If you don't have faith and you don't obey, God can't do it because you limit him through your lack of faith. Faith is not just a feeling. Faith is an action. And God is asking you, will you have faith that I can heal you and deliver you? And you're going, yes, I believe. And God goes, "Uh, uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, I never said believe. I said, will you have faith? Because faith has legs and it walks. That's right. We live by faith, not by sight. That's right. Meaning you got to take a step. Yeah. And that step God keeps bringing up to you through conversations, maybe through dreams, maybe through when you're reading something, it just pops up, maybe through a thought, maybe through people just texting you certain things, maybe a post on Instagram keeps popping up or something on Instagram keeps popping up and God's trying to get to you through Instagram because you won't reply to his DM. Yeah. Come on. The only connection that you need to make in this season is my healing is connected to my obedience. My healing is connected to my obedience. My healing is connected to my obedience. Your healing is connected to your obedience. So here's my conclusion. And thank you, worship team, for coming up. God will put you on trial. By the way, I'm reading a lot because if I elaborate on this, we'll be here forever. God will put you on trial to show you the ugly inside of you. Say amen. All right, focus, okay? You back in? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and be like, focus. All right. Now listen to this part, okay? Because this pretty much sums up the whole thing. And this is the thought I want you to leave with, okay? Okay? Yep. You focused? Yes. You're not texting? No. No? Are you sure you're not texting? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. God will put you on trial to show you the ugly inside of you. And he will give you your next steps for healing. So, what is God calling you to do in this season where he's offering deliverance? What is God calling you to do? Is it to remove specific people from your life? Is it to end a relationship that he's been stirring you to? Is it to be generous so that you can break the power of greed? Is it to let go of a job? Is it to step into accountability? Is it to commit to God's kingdom? Is it to get away from life's noise and get with him for a little bit? What are you wrestling with? What are you wrestling with? What is God calling you to in this season? All I can tell you is this. If you obey what he's been nudging at your heart with, you will not regret it. And you will live a fulfilled, blessed life of freedom. Please okay. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.